It looks like we have the notification now that we are live stream live. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first meeting of the 2021 Legislative Coordinating Commission Compensation Council. My name is Gail Olson, and I am serving as the convener for this meeting. I will call this virtual meeting of the Compensation Council to order. It's Friday, February 5th, 2021 at 2.02 p.m. And we have a quorum present. I believe everybody on the council is present. So thank you for that. Reminder, I think we've been through all of this, but uh, just to make sure members should be muted when you're not speaking. And if you're not, please go ahead and do that now. If you want to speak, use the raise your hand feature, uh, which is down where it says um, reactions. If you click on reactions, it will give you the little hand that you can wave and we'll be watching for that. And I know Sally and Michelle and Greg will be helping me to make sure I see those. Uh, we may be using roll call to vote, and you may need to unmute yourself at that time to vote. Um, and I just want to, we have a, a very diverse group, some respects today, and I just want to find out if everybody is comfortable with using first names on the council, or would you prefer to use titles? And if you can just Wave your hand if you're okay with first names. And if not, okay. I think we'll, we'll go with that. All right. I think members should have already accessed the materials for today's meeting uh, on the website. But for our viewing audience, the Compensation Council is established by the legislature to provide recommendations to the legislature regarding compensation for Minnesota's judicial branch, constitutional officers, and the heads of state and metropolitan agencies. Information about the work of past councils, as well as meeting information and related documents for the current council are all available online at www.lcc.leg.min, mn, slash comp council. We have a full agenda today and we'll start with introductions of prior and new members as well as the legislative staff assisting the council in its work. Because we're meeting electronically, we will do this in alphabetical order. So as I call your name, please state where you're from, um, whether you have previously served on the council and a very brief statement about your interest in serving on the council. So that means we will start out with David Ask. Hello, thank you, Gail. Um, I'm David Asp. I um, This is my third time on the council. So uh, I was on in 2019 and 2017, appointed by um, Chief Justice Lori Gilday. Um, I'm an attorney at Lackers Grindel Nowen um, and I, uh, and interested, of course, in the um, in the adequate compensation of the judiciary, and it's been very interesting to be a part of this in years past, and uh, look forward to participating this year as well. So, thank you, Kathy Brown. Yes, my name is Kathy Brown. This is my first term on this. I was also appointed by Chief Justice Lori Gilday. Um, my experience is I've been at the University of Minnesota for uh, nearly 30 years and recently just retired from the position of Vice President for Human Resources. I'm currently doing some teaching at the in the College of Education there. Um, so I look forward to this experience and hope my human resource experience will be um, a contributing factor. Great, thank you. Richard Cohen. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Dick Cohen, an appointee of uh, the Chief Justice to the, uh, uh, to the Council this time. I had served previously 
a couple go arounds as a state legislator. And uh, that was uh, uh, a number of years ago. And uh, this year I just retired from the legislature after I think 40 years in the place. <laughs> and, uh, and primarily was uh, chairman of the finance committee, the Senate finance committee for a number of years prior to that chairman of the uh, state government finance division. So I've been in and around state government for many years and have been involved with the issues of compensation, relative, whether it be judiciary, administrative, um, uh, legislative. And so I have some experience on that end of it. Thank you. Annie Deckert. Good afternoon, Annie Deckert. Uh, city of Elk River and City of Fergus Falls. I have about 17 years of experience in economic development in both the public and private sector. Um, most recently, I was um, hired as the CEO of Greater Fergus Falls. It's a nonprofit uh, economic development organization. I was appointed by the Chief Justice, and this is my third term, and I very much enjoyed uh, being part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Douse. Hi, I'm Sean Douse uh, from the city of Red Wing, uh, just uh, retired as uh, mayor of the city of Red Wing. I'm currently uh, serving as the chair of the Minnesota State Arts Board, been on the Arts Board for about three terms uh, and have been appointed to this commission. This is my first time by Governor Walls. Uh, I, I look at this as a continuing opportunity to serve the people of Minnesota and I look, really look forward to that. And uh, thank you. Thank you. James Fox. Uh, hello, yes, this is my third term. I was appointed by the governor. Um, I'm from Little Canada. And um, my background is compensation. I have been a compensation consultant to state and public organizations for about 35 years. So I'm deeply aware of the issues with regard to compensation. Although I have to admit that uh, elected officials and appointed officials is a uh, strange compensation issue to to deal with, but uh, <laughs> looking forward to it. Hopefully this time they will actually take our recommendations, <laughs> but, but we shall see. Thank you. Hope springs eternal. Yeah. Peter Gregory. Hi, good afternoon, Pete Gregory. Uh, this is my second time serving with the council. The last time I served, I was in private practice and uh, now I'm an in-house attorney for Presbyterian Homes and Services. I was appointed by the Chief Justice, so of course I have uh, some interest in the judiciary, uh, but given my current role um, I, with policy implications on my desk most of the day, I have interest uh, beyond the judiciary as well. And I live uh, in Minneapolis with my wife and four boys. Thank you, Peter. Noah Hobbs. Noah Hobbs, uh, out of Duluth. I'm a former Duluth City Councilor, and I think uh, my interest in this is we had to hire a Chief Administrative Officer, Police Chief, Fire Chief, almost every department head. Um, so making sure that we could still um, attract and retain the best and brightest to public uh, public service. And I was appointed by uh, Governor Walls. Thank you, Noah. Samuel Kaplan. Uh, Sam, are you able to, oh, there you are. You're up. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute. I think you got it. I, I, doesn't that work? It's working. We can hear you now. Okay. Thank you all for your patience. I practice law in Minneapolis for many decades. I'm with the firm of Kaplan, Strangis and Kaplan. And I have been a practicing lawyer for a very long time, excepting for the period of 2009 to 2013, when I served as the American ambassador to Morocco. This is my first tour of duty on the council. I care a lot about what people who are running the state of Minnesota are being paid and are being properly compensated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amanda Matchett. Hi, I'm Amanda Matchett. I'm an associate general counsel at Infor in downtown St. Paul. This is my first term on the Compensation Council and I was appointed by Governor Walls. 
Um, I did run for the Minnesota House this past year. I sit on the St. Paul Chamber of Commerce and the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce. And I'm really just trying to find additional ways to, to serve the community. And as an, a lawyer, you know, particularly the legal community and bringing a d diverse perspective to all of that. So I look forward to serving. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Kathleen Meyerly. Uh, good afternoon. I'm a, a retired Mayo Clinic attorney living in Rochester, Minnesota. This is actually my third uh, term on the Compensation Council. I served twice under Governor Pawlenty. And I have a very strong interest in a stable and sustainable salary system for our state elected officials and the judiciary. Thank you. Mr. Meyerson, I saw you earlier. Bob Meyerson. Uh, hello, uh, I'm a banker in um, Stearns, Candy, Ojai and uh, Wright counties since um, 1977. Prior to that, I was a short-term visiting uh, professor of history at the U of M, taught the uh, German and Jewish survey courses, but I did not survive. Uh, I'm very interested in having a strong judiciary, uh, both for personal reasons, namely business reasons, uh, we want good courts, we want ha to have access to them, and we want good people in those uh, positions. Great, thank you. Uh, this is, I will introduce myself again, Gail Olson. This is my third time on the council. <laughs> I too am interested in the best government that we can provide to the state of Minnesota. And I think an appropriate compensation is a key, one of the tools that we need to use to accomplish that. I'm a retired attorney, served about half of my career at the Attorney General's Office in Versailles right. Humphrey, and the other half as general counsel for the state colleges and university system. Scott Van Binsbergen. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Scott Van Binsbergen. I'm from Montevideo in Western Minnesota. Um, I have been, a, this is my first uh, term on the council. I was appointed by Governor Waltz. I'm a business owner, uh, own multiple businesses and still do. And we have offices in, in Montevideo and in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and my interest in this is to serve and, and to give back in any way in a in a positive manner, I can. Thank you. Charlie Weaver. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is my first term on this council. I'm excited about that. I was appointed by Governor Walls. Uh, my background is as a lawyer, a legislator. I was a commissioner for Governor Ventura and Governor Palenti's chief of staff. So I've got that background. And um, when I found out I could be on a committee with Dick Cohen and Sam Kaplan, <laughs> I, I said yes immediately. So that's why I'm on this, this committee. Great, good, thank you. And Nick Zerwas. Yeah, my name's Nick Zerwas. Um, I served four terms in the Minnesota House of Representatives during that time. Uh, worked pretty extensively in the public safety uh, judiciary uh, uh, committees and, and looking at budgetary issues, worked pretty closely uh, during that period uh, with the Chief Justice on a myriad of issues, including uh, court security and security at the Supreme Court building itself, and uh, some other capital complex uh, security issues and some compensation issues. And so uh, when, when the Chief Justice asked, I, I think you just don't say no. So. <laughs> I'm excited to I'm excited to continue uh, serving in this capacity. Well, good. Great to have everyone here. It's wonderful to hear from each of you. Thank you. So now we'll move to the next item on the agenda, which is to elect a chair and a vice chair. And I will start off asking for nominations for chair. Uh, this is Kathy Meyerly. I would nominate Gail Olson. 
could you uh, discuss the, the roles and responsibilities of both positions, please? I can try that. Uh, and I will ask the staff to fill in where necessary. So formally, it's to run the meetings uh, and to um, take roll call votes when needed on a recommendation that you, the council wants to make to the legislature. Uh, there may be some interaction with government officials to get additional information, to make requests or recommendations. And I think um, in the past on occasion, the, particularly the chair, perhaps the vice chair as well, has had some interaction with legislators to convey the report and the information and to, uh, to answer questions that legislators may have. I think those are basically it, but Michelle or Greg, do you have anything to add to that? Sure you do. Sure, I can just add a bit more. Um, so in addition to running the meetings, we traditionally work with the chair to, to establish the agenda based on input and discussion that's um, for future meetings and um, likely would have the chair um, review a draft of the report prior to submission and sending it out to all committee members. So we, we work really closely with the chair on logistics as well as um, inviting in presenters and so forth. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I expect that there is at least one more nomination. Do we have other nominations for chair? Mr. Kaplan, I'm going to call on you. Sam? Is Sam still on? Can you tell? He's on, he's on mute and I can't unmute him. Oh, okay. Did I unmute now? Now you're unmuted. Yep. We can hear you now, Sam. I would like to be a candidate to be chair. All right. Just, just to be clear with the rest of the group, we did hear from Mr. Kaplan ahead of the meeting that he was interested in this, but there was some uncertainty about connections. So uh, he asked, he conveyed to us his interest beforehand. Okay, I'll ask one more time, are there other nominations for chair? Hearing none, uh, Michelle will take the roll call vote. Sally will take the roll for the Sally. group. What's the nomination? Just um, so I think the first the first motion would be, um, or the first vote would be to have a vote on one of the members as to serve as chair, and then the second vote would be on the other nomination. Greg, is that do I procedurally have that correct? Yes. We've only taken nominations at this point for the chair. And I'm actually going to withdraw my name. I appreciate the nomination. Go ahead, Greg. If that's the case, then Sally would call the roll for um, electing um, Mr. Kaplan as the chair. Ready? Yes, go ahead, Sally. Okay. David Asp. Yes. Kathy Brown. Yes. Richard Cohen. Yes. Annie Deckert. Yes. Sean Douse. Yes. Jim Fox. Yes. Yes. Peter Gregory. Yes. Noah Hobbs. Yes. Sam Kaplan. I guess yes. <laughs> Amanda Matchett? Yes. Kathy Meyerly? Yes. Bob Meyerson? No. Gail Olson? Yes. Scott Van Binsbergen? Yes. Charlie Weber? Yes. Nick Serwas? Yes. 15 yes, one no. All right, Sam Kaplan is elected as chair, and I now 
hand the meeting over to Mr. Kaplan. Well, Ms. Olson, thank you very much. This is a very prestigious group. I'm very impressed and I'm very honored to serve. Can I be heard? Yes, Mr. Kaplan, we can hear you. And what would um, traditionally happen at this time, Mr. Kaplan, is that you would um, move to the next agenda item. Which would be vice chair. A vice chair. And then um, depending on your preference after the vice chair is elected, you could ask the vice chair to, to conduct the remaining portion of the meeting or as chair, you could continue to conduct the remaining portion of the meeting. Are there nominations for vice chair? I would nominate Gail, Gail Olson. If she's willing to do it, Gail, I think your background would be really helpful here to help out the chair and all of us. Thank you. Are there other nominations? Are there other nominations? Gail, are you prepared to serve? I am. Without going through a roll call vote, can we elect Gail by acclamation? Is there any objections? Ms. So Olson, members, you, uh, members, if you could unmute your lines and you could do a voice vote. All in favor of so, Gail Olson being vice chair. Aye. 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 Is there anyone in opposition? Ms. Olson, you're elected. Thank you, sir. Very well. well. <laughs> so, Mr. Kaplan, would you like to continue to uh, convene the meeting or would you like the vice chair? No, I'll continue. Okay, unless you... So now we're looking to Stacy Christensen. Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Administration. Are you with us, Stacy? I am, thank you. Thank you for having me today. And I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, I believe you have a PDF version of the PowerPoint, but I will put it up on the screen as well. Sylvia, I'm chair. Okay, I believe everyone can see the PowerPoint. So thank you for having me today. I appreciate the invitation to uh, present on the Data Practices Act and open meeting law. Uh, this is probably going to be a bit of a review for most of you. If uh, you heard uh, either me or my colleague well, in, in the past. And guests. Nothing is more important to us than everyone's safety and well-being. Federal law requires you to keep your Okay. I <laughs> think that was that was not me. Um, okay. So as, as was mentioned, my name is Stacy Christensen, and I am um, an assistant commissioner and general counsel at the Department of Administration. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about uh, the Data Practices Act and open meeting law. This is going to be a very high level overview. I'm probably going to go through this information fairly quickly. I'm going to ask that you save your questions until the, the end. I'll pause after I talk about data practices for questions and then at the end about the open meeting law uh, because I can't see the, the raise hand feature when I'm sharing my screen. So if you'll indulge me in keeping your questions to the end, I'd appreciate it. Uh, just wanted to give a, a brief little plug for the Data Practices Office, who is uh, your statewide expert on the Data Practices Act and open meeting law. Uh, they are uh, available to provide informal technical assistance on both laws, uh, serving both the public and the government, including the legislature and the media. So um, they the, the office is, is there to help on all questions of, of 
data practices and open meeting law. Uh, they have a variety of resources, including a, a website with a plethora plethora of uh, information on both laws. Um, they do kind of um, uh, one hour webinars, live webinars. They have PowerPoints, PowerPoint trainings on the website um, and uh, information pieces available. Uh, the formal work that the office does is the staff assistance um, to the commissioner of administration related to her duties um, in issuing advisory opinions on both data practices issues and open meeting law issues. Uh, they also provide legislative assistance when uh, folks are interested in amending either the data practices act or open meeting law um, acting as the kind of technical expert and provide training such as I am doing today. So without further ado, moving into uh, Minnesota Statutes Chapter 13, which is the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act. Uh, why is this important? I think all of you are probably aware of our Data Practices Act. This is Minnesota's version of uh, freedom of information law uh, combined with a, a privacy act. Um, so if you're familiar with the, the federal government, um, the, the way that they uh, treat these laws, they have a different kind of FOIA law, which is public access and a privacy law. Um, in Minnesota, we uh, combine both of our laws into one and call it a, a data practices act. Um, so as you can see from this slide, it does a, a variety of really important things, um, promotes accountability and transparency, uh, lets our, um, our public understand what government is doing and why, um, and um, make, make, understand why government is making the decisions that they're making. Um, the unique aspect of Minnesota's Data Practices Act is we assume that everything is public unless the legislature makes a decision to classify data as not public. Uh, this is different um, than the, the approach the federal government and the majority of other states take. Um, most have kind of an exemption model where government has a lot of discretion in making determinations about what level of access the public gets to government information. In Minnesota, the legislature has reserved that right to themselves um, to specifically classify information that is not public. Um, so our law is long and a bit complex um, based on kind of how, how that works with the legislature, uh, that everything has to be specifically classified unless it's presumed to be public. Um, so a good example for this particular council is, um, you know, considering the work that you're doing on the council, um, your email correspondence related to the official work of this council is going to be presumed public um, and the, the public could have access to it upon request. Uh, so in looking at some of the, the duties that, that government entities have to um, make sure that they're complying with uh, related to the Data Practices Act, um, the, the law defines government data, and I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. As I mentioned, it presumes data are public. The legislature classifies certain data as not public. Uh, federal law can also classify data as not public. Um, so we'll look, look to federal law sometimes for some of our classifications. Because our law provides um, both public access and privacy rights, that's an important element of our Data Practices Act, that it provides uh, privacy rights for individuals when government collects information about them, certain information about them. And then, of course, it provides the public with the right to access public data. Um, data subjects, so when the, the government collects data from individuals, have a right that their data is accurate, complete, current, and secure. Um, and then the last uh, bullet on this slide, the, the Data Practices Act only applies to government entities, and there are a number of defined government entities in the law. It doesn't apply to the legislature or judicial branches. Um, it does apply to this council uh, because it fits as a, a state agency, which um, includes boards and commissions. So statewide entities would be subject to the law. 
Uh, the other two related laws that I just want to mention are the Official Records Act and Records Management Statute, um, where the Government Data Practices Act classifies data, protects data, and provides for public access. Uh, the Official Records Act and Records Management Statute detail the obligations that government have in creating, keeping, and then destroying when no longer needed official records. Um, so while government data I'll talk about on the next slide is kind of the broad category of everything that government has, official records are a smaller segment of that, um, that document the official work of, of a government entity. Um, the Official Records Act does not define official records. Entities get to make their own determinations as to what constitutes an official record in their entity. And then they have to detail that in a records retention schedule, which is what the records management statute um, discusses. So all of those records are detailed, and then the retention period are, are placed on, on all of those record sets. Um, so government knows how long they have to keep things and when they can um, make determinations about destroying records when they're no longer needed. So the definition of government entity is everything that government has in any recorded form. Um, so it can include video and audio, photographs, emails, anything that's recorded in some form is government data. Um, the only thing it does not include are mental impressions, <laughs> our thoughts. Um, believe it or not, that was something that was litigated at one point many years ago. Um, and the, the court said, no, it actually has to be um, put into some sort of recorded form to constitute government data. Um, so it's everything really that that government has. Uh, this is the, the classic classification scheme that the legislature um, made uh, kind of put into place for our Data Practices Act to work. Um, so when I talk about classifications, it really means is something public or is something not public? Um, is, if something is classified as not public, it's gonna fit into one of four different categories. So public is easy to explain. Public data is available to anyone for any reason. Um, government cannot ask why someone is requesting public data. They can't ask a requester to identify themselves. It is just something government has to provide. An example of that would be um, a government employee's name. That's going to be public data. Um, the other categories of not public data um, are, we distinguish between data on individuals and data not on individuals. Um, so data on individuals can either be private or confidential. And data not on individuals, so data on buildings, data on cars, data on businesses, um, will either be non-public or protected non-public. Private and non-public mean the same thing. Confidential and protected non-public mean the same thing. So the second level of access is private or non-public. Those data are available to the data subject, the individual whom the government is collecting data about. It's available to those within a government entity who have a business reason to see the data. Uh, entities authorized by law. So the legislature can write in when different entities may have access to private or non-public data. And those authorized by the data subject, and that is um, another way of saying by consent. Um, so an example of private data is an individual social security number. It's not available to the public, but it's available to the subject of that data and individuals within an entity who collect it for business reasons. The final level of classification is confidential or protected non-public, and that's the tightest level of classification. There are not a lot of data classified in this way because the difference between confidential and private is that a data subject does not have access to confidential data. So the biggest example of that is going to be active civil or criminal investigative data where the subject of the investigation could be jeopardized if the subject of it had access to it. Um, most uh, confidential data, this example of active civil or criminal investigative data does become public at some point when the investigation is complete. And so that provides the public with some um, the transparency around how the investigation was conducted, that type of thing. Um, some of the uh, personal data may revert to public, or I'm sorry, to private um, when an investigation is complete. 
Um, so what are kind of the general duties uh, related to the Data Practices Act? Um, there has to be a, a responsible authority for data practices. Um, that's going to be the individual that is ultimately responsible for all of the, the decisions around government data. Um, the responsible authority has to appoint a data practices compliance official. That can be the same person as the responsible authority, um, but it's it's two positions. Um, the, the data practices compliance official is kind of the go-to person um, if people have questions, if um, people are making data requests, that type of thing. Um, and then uh, an entity has to have two required policies related to data requests, one for the public, um, how they would go about making data requests, and one for subjects. So when government collects data, it has to detail how government is protecting the data, how the data subject can get access, um, those types of things. Uh, just a little bit of application. Why is this important? Why does this matter to, to you as a member of the council? Um, the, there may be some data about you. Um, Section 13.601 discusses uh, you as your um, uh, role on this council. Um, some public data about you will be your name and address, your training and background. Um, and the, the other important thing really for this council is to understand when you are using your technology for as a member, as an official member of this council, uh, the council related data are government data. That doesn't mean that now everything you do um, as you know, just a, a private member um, of the public is government data, just the official work that you do as a member of the council um, will become government data. So I'm going to pause before I move on to the open meeting law. If, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, I can't see the hand raise function. Okay, I will leave time at the end for questions if you didn't get yourself unmuted in time. Um, so the, the next law I'm gonna talk about is the open meeting law. This one may be of more interest to, to this particular council. Um, this is Minnesota Statutes Chapter 13D. These are the key discussion topics that I'll cover, um, which groups and meetings are subjects, the types of meetings, um, closed meetings, which is probably not gonna be applicable um, very much to this particular council and some special considerations. Um, the open meeting law, unlike the Data Practices Act, is very short. Um, it's only a few pages, uh, and most of the requirements of the open meeting law have actually been detailed by the courts um, through, through litigation. So while the data practices is long, <laughs> the open meeting law is short, um, but, but certainly um, provides some raises some interesting questions, um, even though it's, it's not long in length. Um, the open meeting law, the gist of it is with limited exceptions, all meetings of public bodies must be open to the public. Um, the public is available to attend open meetings. The public does not necessarily have a right to speak at open meetings. The courts have been um, uh, clear about this, that your right to attend um, is, is limited to that. Um, so meetings subject to the open meeting law, uh, the, the open meeting law does not have a definition section. Uh, so the courts have um, gone ahead and defined some of the issues and terms uh, in the open meeting law. Um, so meetings subject to the law are based on uh, a ruling from 1983 by the Supreme Court um, called, called the quorum rule. So what the court said is that only those meetings that are subject to the open meeting law are when there's a quorum, which is a majority or more of a full public body, and that quorum is discussing, deciding, or receiving information as a group relating to its official business. So it has to meet both parts of that rule to be a meeting subject to the open meeting law. If it doesn't meet both of those parts, um, it's not a meeting. So for example, if you have a, a, a 10 member public body and two or three of those members are having a discussion about something, even if it's related to official business, that is not a meeting subject to the open meeting law. There would have to be a quorum or more of individuals of that public body discussing for a meeting to be subject. 
Um, types of meetings, uh, you can have regular meetings. So these are just your, your regular run of the mill meetings where you set the schedule and that schedule is on, on file. Uh, special meetings are anything that is not a regularly scheduled meeting. So if something comes up that a public body has to discuss, they have to provide three, a three day advance notice of um, the posting including the date, time, place, and meeting purpose. A regular meeting does not have to include a purpose, but a special meeting does because it has that advanced posting requirement. Emergency meetings are few and far between. Those are when there's some sort of situation that you can't, that you must meet um, even before that three day threshold. Um, so usually that we've seen those emergency meetings, um, you know, if there's some sort of natural disaster, um, there's some sort of uh, issue that the public body has to deal with in an emergent situation. Um, the notice requirement for emergency meetings is a good faith notice to the media and anyone else that's requested notice. So it does not re uh, require a posted notice that like a special meeting does. Um, meetings not covered by the law, I mentioned this, any meeting of less than a quorum of members, um, chance or social gatherings, the, the courts have weighed in and said if, if a quorum of a public body is attending a banquet or a retirement party, you know, when we can go back to doing that in person again, um, that's going not going to be a meeting subject to the open meeting law, as long as the public body members do not start discussing official business as a quorum. So um, just be careful not to do that if you're attending a party together. Um, tra certain trainings are not covered by the open meeting law as long, again, as there's not a discussion about official business. Um, and that's been confirmed by um, an attorney general opinion, a fairly old one, which was confirmed in a more recent advisory opinion um, in 2016. Um, so again, uh, Discussions unrelated to the official business of a public body um, when they're receiving training is okay um, and not subject to the open meeting law. Uh, a few special considerations um, in uh, use of email. So again, the open meeting law does not have definitions about, you know, when a meeting is conducted. Um, an advisory opinion in 2019 cautioned against using email where a quorum of a public body is on that email having a discussion about official business. Um, so making a decision about something uh, where the public does not have um, the ability to observe uh, could be a violation. Uh, the courts have not weighed in on this um, yet, so it just is a could be violation, but something to be aware of. Uh, one way communications are okay. So if the chair of a public body or an executive director or administrative staff is sending out um, documents, um, just here, here's the meeting agenda, here are the um, informational um, things that we'll talk about at the meeting, that's fine as long as there isn't a subsequent discussion that happens via email. So something to be um, aware of. Um, serial meetings are those meetings of less than a quorum where two members talk, and then those two members talk to two more members, and then those two members talk to two more, more members to kind of forge a majority outside of that open meeting context. Uh, the courts have not said definitively serial meetings are a violation. Uh, they'd have to analyze the facts of the situation, uh, but it's something to caution against. So make sure you're not trying to forge a majority outside of that open meeting context. Uh, again, closed meetings are probably not super apl applicable to this group, um, but it's just important to know that meetings can only be closed if required or permitted in the law. Most of those are in the open meeting law. Some sit outside of the open meeting law and other statute sections. Um, there's not a general personnel exception to closed meetings. Um, it has to be one of the, the required uh, reasons that the legislature has set out. Um, Public bodies must make a statement on the record before closing the meeting where they describe the statute section or the legal authority that allows them to close the meeting and describe what will be discussed. So if a meeting is going to be closed pursuant to the attorney client privilege, they'd have to say we're closing the meeting um, pursuant to the attorney client privilege to discuss XYZ litigation. So the public has a right to know kind of what generally will be discussed at that closed meeting. Um, public bodies must um, 
uh, close certain meetings um, under the law, and then some are permitted. So such as the attorney and client privilege. So there are some must close and some permissible closings. Uh, meetings and technology. So, you know, this is this is how we're able to meet like this. The, the open meeting law um, allows um, meetings to be held remotely. Um, interestingly, Minnesota had this uh, provision, a couple of provisions on the books, um, even before the pandemic. So we were positioned very well um, for public bodies to meet in a remote way uh, without having to enact um, legislation or an executive order. So um, it was um, good, good foresight by the legislature to have that in place. Um, there are two provisions. One, this is the first one, 13D.015. Uh, this applies only to statewide bodies. So a group such as, such as this can hold telephone meetings in for any reason, because they're a statewide group. There are very specific things they have to follow, as you can see on this slide, if they do hold um, a telephone meeting. Um, so it's important to follow all of those requirements. Um, advisory opinion 18-018 um, listed on the slide confirmed that this only applies to statewide groups, so not local government. Um, the one that everyone is using right now, the provision is 13D.021, and this was the one that was on the books to deal um, with or have remote meetings in a, a health pandemic or emergency declared under Chapter 12, so exactly where we're sitting in right now. Um, the requirements are not as stringent as the um, telephone meetings, um, so the requirements are everyone has to be able to hear and see one another, um, one member of the entity has to be in the regular meeting room and less unfeasible. So in a pandemic, that is um, highly likely that that's unfeasible and votes have to be taken by roll call. So as you already witnessed, your votes have to be taken by roll call. Um, the public can monitor from a remote site at practical. So as you are also experiencing that public monitoring is, is happening via uh, YouTube live stream and members may all um, and, and the notice that members may participate remotely. And that was also on your website. So everything is, is covered here um, for these types of remote meetings. Um, there are penalties and remedies um, for penalties for violating the open meeting law, um, an intentional violation. So this has to be intent um, to violate the law. There's personal liability. Um, three separate intentional violations. Um, again, these are all court proceedings, so someone would have to sue um, to enforce any of these penalties. Um, the, there is no, the important thing I think on this slide is there's no reversal of a public body's actions taken while violation um, of the law. Uh, so that's pretty, um, the, the courts have weighed in on this. There's no kind of a remedy to re reverse an action that was taken in an improperly closed meeting. All right, and then finally, the interaction of the open meeting law and data practices. Um, public bodies may discuss not public data in an open meeting if it is related to their agenda items. Um, so the, the law sets that out very specifically that that is permissible. Um, the data retain their original classification, so public bodies just need to be aware that any um, documentation or information they put out subsequently um, is going to be available to the public, so not to put not public data in that. Um, and then recording of meetings. Uh, public meetings are not required to be recorded. They absolutely can be. A lot of uh, public bodies are doing that right now. Um, but closed meetings must be recorded unless closed under the attorney-client privilege. Um, and then they have to be kept uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, they could be public with, public with the not public data redacted or removed um, if someone requested uh, those meetings, those recordings. So that was very uh, high level um, and uh, kind of fast. So I am just going to open it up and stop sharing my screen and I'll open it up to anyone if you have questions. Stacy, in the history of the Compensation Council, has there ever been an issue about any of the matters you were discussing? Not that I'm aware of. It's not likely there would be. I would think that we're pretty open. I agree. I agree. Are there other questions? Comments? Thank you, Stacy, very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. We now move on to the duties of the Compensation Council and Stephanie James. Mr. Chair, 
Yes. Mr. Chair, this is Michelle Weber with the LCC and there are two um, procedural things that the council has to do prior to moving on to Ms. James's presentation. The council has to adopt uh, the data practices policy for data subjects and the data practices policy for the public. Um, it could be one motion to adopt both policies. These are model policies that the Department of Administration has developed about how um, public data is handled or, or data is handled and um, responding to data requests. I, as the staff person for the council, am listed as the responsible authority and we in the LCC would manage that. But we do need a motion and a roll call to adopt those policies. Now, how long has these uh, rules been in effect? Um, Stacy, could you answer the question about how long the model policies have been available? And then Greg Hubinger, would you be able to answer how long the how how, how long the council has used these policies previously? So the uh, data practices office developed the model policies, I would say back in 2007 or 2008, they've been, uh, uh, the model policy uh, requirement has been on the books for um, probably 20 plus years. These, uh, this current iteration that you um, would see right now was probably developed around 2007, 2008. So they've been um, available for entities to use and adopt for quite a while. <laughs> and I assume there's been no dispute over these provisions. No, nope, there have not been. Great question. So we're looking for a motion to uh, for this particular group? Yeah, so we're looking for a motion to adopt both policies. It can be one motion that adopts both of them, and then Sally in our office would take the roll call vote on it. This is Scott Van Bitsburg, and I'll make a motion. We um, accept both. Is there a second to Scott's motion? Is Sean down? Second. second. Well, let's call the roll. David Asp. Yes. Kathy Brown. Yes. Richard Cohen. Yes. Annie Deckert. Yes. Sean Douse. Yes. Jim Fox. Yes. Peter Gregory. Get up off. Noah Hobbs. Yes. Sam Kaplan? Yes. Amanda Matchett? Yes. Kathleen Meyerly? Yes. Bob Meyerson? Yes. Gail Olson? Yes. Scott Van Binsbergen? Yes. Charlie Weaver? Yes. Nick Zerwas? Aye. Peter Gregory? So 15 yes, one absent. The motion passes. Uh, have we done what we need to do, or can we move on to the duties of the Compensation Council? Yes, Mr. Chair. Stephanie James. Mr. Chair and members, um, you have in your packets um, uh, memos um, uh, that I'm going to walk through here. First of all, on the duties of the Compensation Council. Um, first, your legal underpinnings uh, flow from first the constitution, which requires that the duties and salaries of executive officers be prescribed by law. And then the legislature has tasked you with recommending to them um, compensation of um, uh, judges. That's at all levels, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals and the district court judges, as well as um, constitutional officers, and then also agency heads. Um, you, and more specifically, um, for the agency head recommendations, you're required to include the appropriate group to which each agency head should be assigned, and then also a limit on the maximum range of salaries for that group um, as a percentage of the salary of the governor. Now, in this past year, the, the governor has issued an executive order by which his salary is reduced by 10%. That executive order also says that that executive order 
that reduction in salary for the governor does not apply to um, the salaries of other folks whose salaries are based on a percentage of his salary. So you'll be working from his salary number, which is 127,629. Um, the council's recommendations are due by April 1st of this year. Um, the Council's recommendations don't go into effect unless or until the legislature adopts them through a law that's enacted. Um, if, if the legislature does that, your recommendations would go into effect for um, const constitutional officers in 2023, um, the first Monday in January. And then the agency head salaries are um, effective retroactively to January 1st of the year in which they're made, so this year. Um, you are asked to consider a few things. This is in statute, these factors for the uh, council to consider as you're setting salaries, or as, as you're recommending salaries. First, the amount of compensation paid in government service and the private sector to persons with similar qualifications. Second, the amount that is needed to attract and retain experienced and competent persons. And then the ability of the state to pay the recommended levels. Um, you might wonder why it is that your recommendations don't go into effect until so far in the future. Um, and that is a remnant of a time when your enabling statute also required you to make recommendations on legislator salaries. But a few years ago that function was carved out and moved to a new salary council. And so um, this, this date delay is a remnant of that. Um, and it, it, it might be something that you wish didn't happen. You, it might be a recommendation that you make to modify the statute to get rid of that two year delay. Um, after you've made your recommendations, uh, the council ceases to exist. So you turn in your report by April 1st and then you no longer exist. Um, you're certainly able uh, to make recommendations that are go beyond what your statutorily required recommendations are. They won't have any sort of official status, um, but many compensation councils before you have made, made recommendations beyond just the salaries that you're asked to um, get, give information about. Um, if you wish to meet after April 1st, you can do so, but you will not be receiving in per diem or expense reimbursements and you won't have administrative and support services. So I, I, I think those are the major items for you to consider on as to your duties. Are there any questions about that? Does the council have any authority in and of itself? Um, you, Mr. Chair and members, you, um, there's, there is no action that you would take that would become law without action by the legislature. Is there any limitation on the scope of what can be recommended? So that if the recommendation is to decouple constitutional officer salaries in relation to the governor. They can do that. It doesn't mean it will happen. Mr. Chair, members, that's, that's correct. Are there questions? Thank you, Stacy. Uh, yeah, this is Jim Fox. I do have a question. Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> Stacy, whether any of the uh, any of the recommendations were considered by the legislature, the last recommendations? Mr. Chair and members. Um, uh, Definitely. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members. Um, you know, I am going to phone a friend here. Uh, Mr. Hubinger has a better handle perhaps on the history of how the recommendations have been received by the legislature. And actually, that's the next item on the agenda. So, you'll be talking about that. I'm ahead of the game. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, then let, <clears throat> let us move on. 
to the overview of the prior recommendations. There's no action required concerning the duties of our council. We can talk about both items four and five together. So, uh, this is Greg Cubinger. I'm the uh, I'm a staff person with the Legislative Coordinating Commission, and I have been in that capacity working to support the uh, work of this council for many years. Um, this year, I'm helping in um, assembling some of the data that you might need. Um, I'm going to just go through some of the um, um, information from other councils and some background information that might help inform you in your work. Um, I've shared my screen, which is a listing of the recommendations made by the previous council. This might help set the stage for you to understand the environment in which you're working uh, to make recommendations to the current legislature. Um, in two years ago, the governor's salary is the same as it is now, 127,600. The council two years ago recommended a number of interim increases with a final salary of $166,000 uh, that would be effective in January of 2022. That recommendation was not acted on by the legislature. For the other constitutional officers, uh, which are in law are, are set as a percentage of the governor's salary, um, the, there were various interim increases recommended by the 2019 council uh, with final salaries that would be effective in January of 22. Uh, for the Lieutenant Governor of 114,000, for the Attorney General at 157,000, and setting the same salary for the State Auditor and the Secretary of State as at 149,000. Um, that council also recommended that the, that the state should study the salary relationships of constitutional officers. There was no action taken on that. With respect to the judiciary, the Council in 2019 recommended three and a half percent increases in January of 21 and January of 22 for judges on the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. That council also recommended somewhat higher increases for district court judges of 3.75 percent each of those two years. Um, there were increases made to the judges that were the same across. Um, the, the appellate courts and the district courts of two and a half percent in July of 19 and July of uh, 2020. Those are the only increases or the only um, action items related to the uh, positions that are under the purview of this council. With respect to your responsibility to make recommendations on salary ranges for agency heads, currently those are set as a percentage of the governor's salary of 133% for the larger agencies, 120% for the midsize, and 25% for two smaller metro agencies. Those range limits are adjusted annually by inflation. Um, the previous council uh, recommended decoupling ranges from the salary of the governor and also recommended that the state should look at the salary relationship of agency heads. There was no change made as a result of that recommendation. And then finally, um, the council um, recommended um, some changes um, for how the council operates. Uh, one um, was the issue that got raised a little while ago about the long time frame within which the council's recommendations take effect two years out. Uh, for this council, the council that's meeting now, your recommendations under the statute would take effect in. Uh, January of 23 and January of 24. The council in 2019 thought that it might be more helpful for the legislature if the council, this council's recommendations took effect immediately um, at the beginning of the biennium in which the legislature is setting the appropriation, the, the budgets for the biennial budgets for state government. Uh, there was no change as a real result of that recommendation. And then finally, the uh, council recommended that or raise the issue about not having enough time to conduct proper del deliberations if the members don't have to be appointed until January 15th, but still have the report done by um, April 1. So the, the previous council recommended that appointments be made by December 15th to give more time for the council to do its work. 
Mr. Chair, that's a quick rundown of the recommendations that were made by the last council. Um, I could take questions now if you have any or else move on to the next um, item. Well, let me ask. Let me ask the basic question, and that is how often in your experience, and you've been doing this for quite some time, have the recommendations of the council received no action at all, as is the case with the last council? Um, Mr. Chair, I think I'll bring up this next table, uh, which shows a uh, longer salary history for uh, the constitutional officers and the judges. Um, you can see that the um, constitutional officer salaries have not changed since 2016 uh, when they, re they received a 3% increase. Those in that increase was actually adopted by the 2013 legislature. So it's been eight years since the legislature has adopted increases for um, constitutional officers. Um, if you look at the judges, uh, you can see that they receive more consistent increases, but they, I don't believe, have ever matched the recommendations of the Compensation Council. They've always been um, less than what was recommended by the council. In the course of those years where there was no action, at times did one of the houses, the, the House or the Senate, vote or are considerate and the other did not? Mr. Chair, two years ago, um, the chair of the council, Tom Berg, uh, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee about the recommendations for the state's judges. Um, in other years, the chair has appeared in various House or Senate committees to present the council's recommendations. Um, I think I can't remember a year when the House or the Senate adopted increases for one of these groups, uh, only to have no action taken by the other. Uh, are there other questions or observations? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Hubinger, this is Charlie Weaver. Uh, have you considered in the past, do you look at comparative salaries of similar sized states in terms of the governor's salary, I'm thinking of state of Washington, Wisconsin, maybe others to give us a sense for, you know, whether we're in sync around the country or not? Mr. Chair, there's a, um, a handout that we'll get to in a couple of minutes that shows what the salaries for these positions are across the country, uh, compiled by the council of state governments. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, this is Jim Fox. Can I add a little here? Um, Charlie, I've been on the council two years now, and we've, we did look at other states, and we did some ranking and some comparisons of other states. Of course, it's rather difficult to do that because every state is the same and every state is different. Um, but we did, we did look at those comparison salaries, especially last year, in terms of our recommendations. And what did you conclude? Well, we concluded, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that we were somewhere in the 20, 20th rank or 22nd rank, or, or should be, uh, based on where other states are. Um, we are. We are not at that point. Um, we, are, we have fallen significantly below that in the last couple of years. So... Um, uh, one of the states that I'm most familiar with, because I did some work for them, is the state of Rhode Island, which obviously is a very small state. Um, the uh, her go the governor's salary there went from like uh, 97 to about 157 uh, mm. over over the period of time that we've met. So um, I don't I may not have that number exactly correct, but it is it's just one of them that that came you know stuck out to me. I would just add to that, um, there hasn't been a, a significant change in the governor's salary or the constitutional officers, the other officers' salary since 2003, other than the 3% increases in 15 and 16. And that's it. And uh, so it's, it's been a very long time. 
Mr. Chair, this is Sean Dallas. I have a question. Uh, do the recommendations of the Compensation Council, either, either recommendation for changing in procedure or the, uh, the compensation itself, does, does it come with any advocates or advocacy effort in the legislature once it's uh, settled? Mr. A very good question. Mr. Chair and Mr. Dowes, the council's report is submitted to the leadership of the House and Senate, and we generally provide it to the state government committees, which are responsible for uh, setting the budgets for state government. But uh, apart from an initiative by the chair to uh, proactively reach out and uh, present the recommendations, that has been up to the chair's discretion to do that. Thank you. But it, <clears throat> but it doesn't automatically go to the legislature for consideration. Mr. Chair, the report is provided to leadership of the legislature. Um, that is as far as it generally goes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, would there be any reason why we would not want to lobby our uh, conclusions. Uh, this is my third term, like uh, Jim Fox. And for the most part, um, well, I understand we're not elected, we're appointed, but for the most part, our deliberations seem to be ignored. Dick Cohn, do you recall recommendations being brought to you in your capacity over to legislature? Certainly. Um, I'm trying to recall, you know, the, the chairman of the commission in the past has spoken to uh, certainly the state government finance division um, and uh, Representative Sirwas would have to comment relative to the house more recently. It's been a long time since, since I've been in the house. Um, and uh, uh, when, I, when I chaired the finance committee, I had the, I think at least a couple of times I had the, uh, the chair of the council uh, uh, testify before the full finance committee. Um, I'm not sure if there have been presentations to the appropriate policy committees or not. But it never went beyond the committee. You mean in terms of adoption of the recommendations? or at least converted into proposed legislative action? Well, certainly during the budget process when the determination would have been made, um, it's varied. I, I, obviously in terms of adoption, a straight out adoption of the recommendations, that's been quite a while. Um, but certainly the recommendations have fit in with some of the committee discussion and uh, I'd have to re recall as to when, say, maybe the Senate adopted some of it, the House did not, or vice versa. But uh, there have been pieces of the recommendations that have ended up uh, um, in the various uh, finance bills. But there hasn't been separate legislation that's ever passed. It's all been taken into, uh, it, it's all been dealt with in the appropriations and the finance process. And the, the establishment of the budgets, because obviously, what's involved with the increase in the dollar amount for the appropriate uh, agencies. So it's always been done in the appropriations process. But you do agree there's no real sense in going through this and treating this committee as a debating society unless there's some possibility of action being taken. Well, at this point, I'm not going to speak to the legislature, obviously. Um, but certainly, a I would suggest to recommend that uh, you know, the chair and the associate chair um, appear before the uh, the appropriate committees. Uh, now you can make you know, present that as a possibility. Obviously, the respective chairs have to you know place uh, the council's report on the agenda for a meeting. You know that's their determination, but but I would certainly recommend that uh, uh, there be the, the attempt to present uh, the recommendations, and that's happened certainly in the past. Yeah. Uh, 
Are there other observations? Greg, have we covered what you would want to cover? Mr. Chair, one, the last element is the recommendations regarding agency head salary ranges. I noticed that Representative Zervas has his hand raised. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, if I can just uh, uh, piggyback on what Senator Cohen was saying briefly. By all means. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Kaplan. I guess uh, I, I think S Senator Cohen is, is correct in that um, I think the presentation uh, to both the House and Senate uh, by yourself and, and by the Vice Chair, once the report is complete, is, is uh, certainly uh, worth, the, uh, worth your time and, and the committee's time as far as advancing the, the, the mission of the committee and the, and the report, the council and the report that will be adopted by the council. You know, that, that being said, Senator Cohen is, is correct in that each of these uh, recommendations that are in uh, a bundled report will then go to each uh, jurisdiction's uh, 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 committee <laughs> chair finance chair's position to either include or not include in their committee's budget as that's put forward. And, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge uh, that, that the fate of these uh, recommendations hold, you know, quite frankly, aren't whether or not we have the most in-depth analysis or the, uh, the most persuasive uh, uh, presentation on our recommendations. But I think the biggest thing that will have a direct impact on how seriously these recommendations are taken are the budget uh, forecast that's released as part of MMB's February forecast at the end of February that will predict whether or not uh, a looming budget deficit uh, continues to exist uh, for for state government. I think that will have the biggest impact on, on where these recommendations as they're adopted by April 1st, the fate that they, they may have uh, at the legislature. Greg, in your experience, has there been any occasion when the governor or the chief justice has testified along with the chair of the council before the legislature concerning the council's recommend recommendations? Mr. Chair, typically the governor doesn't testify directly before the legislature. I don't know if, and I'm not aware of his staff having um, done that. Typically the commissioner of Minnesota management budget might present on compensation for uh, these officials as the chief budget officer for the state. I'm not aware of the role of the chief justice. Um, later in the, your meeting today, uh, the state court administrator was testifying and he may have some information about that piece. Good. I do Thank know, you. just very, uh, Chair Kaplan, just very briefly, I do know that in years past of serving on the Public Safety Judiciary Finance Committee uh, that uh, Chief Justice Gildea has testified during the Supreme, during the judicial branches uh, budget presentation and advocated for a salary increase uh, for uh, the judicial branch. Uh, so I know that she, uh, you know, not directly with the Compensation Council, but in their overall budget presentation, the Chief Justice has uh, testified before that committee uh, uh, seeking a, a raise uh, for the, the judges that, that serve in Minnesota. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I might. By all means. So, so just to follow up on that, um, uh, the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Gilday is a very strong advocate for the courts, but uh, uh, and, and testifies before uh, all of the 
all the appropriate committees. Uh, but she's not, that's not uh, a first. As best I can recollect, all the Chief Justices have testified uh, in the past. I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I can't go back uh, uh, decades ago, but uh, certainly over my experience in the legislature, um, I think all the Chief Justices have testified at one time or another. And again, some uh, more strongly than others, but they've all testified. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie James, Mr. If, you're still with, if you're still with us, what is the origin of the deadline of April? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, the deadline is um, late enough to allow you all to have done your work, but early enough for the recommendations to be considered with the budget, um, the final work on the budget. And hey, Mr. Chairman, could I just follow up with sure. a very quick question? Ms. James, I assume it's a little bit early for committee deadlines at this point. Mr. Chair and members, yes, I have not seen committee deadlines yet. Mr. Chair, this is Michelle Weber. And there are two members who have their hands raised um, using the features in Zooms. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. I'm not. Um, Call on them. Ms. Meyerly and Mr. Oh. Meyerson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The comment I would like to make is, relates to the work that we're doing. And I think it's important to remember that we need to do this work to document where we should be with adequate compensation for our elected uh, executive officers and the court. Um, it is frustrating that I'm pretty sure even going back to my terms of service in the early 2000s, the legislature has never fully adopted the uh, council recommendations. But by doing our work, we document where it should be. And that to me is a very important function, uh, irrespective of whether the recommendations are adopted. Well said. Another hand was up. Yes, M Mr. Chair, Mr. Meyerson had his hand up. Mr. Meyerson. Mr. Chair, um, while most of these recommendations are budget matters, the, uh, the last one, the time frame, you know, that just seems to me so reasonable and it wouldn't really cost anything and it would improve our ability to, uh, to fulfill our mission. Uh, so I would hope maybe they would, do these recommendations have to come in as a package or is there some way for the, the time frame recommendation to be considered separately? Ms. James? Mr. Chair and members, there is no reason that, that they all have to come in as a package. You just have a deadline by which your work has to be done. And of course, a recommendation about the date change isn't um, part of your statutory mandate. Um, so th there's no reason that couldn't be uh, furthered separately. Um, and then I just wanted to point out that the statute requires you all to present a report, a report or recommendations on these salaries. Um, so, um, so th there's that to consider. Yes, but it does diminish the enthusiasm of the council when the recommendations are not considered year after year. Mr. Chair, fully appreciate that. Uh, Greg, have we talked about your salary survey? Mr. Chair, the next item is to talk about the salary ranges for agency heads, which is another part of your council's work. Uh, we were going to have um, defer to Marta James from the House Research Department to talk about the policy issues there, and then I was going to talk about the data. Let's do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, my name is Martha James, and I am a legislative analyst and attorney with House Research. 
And uh, I'm just going to go over very briefly uh, the agency head salaries. Those are handled a little bit differently by this council. And again, there's uh, memos uh, distributed with the materials for today that goes into this a little bit more. Uh, so the council is also responsible, like uh, Stephanie mentioned, for making recommendations uh, on the ranges of the salary for the heads of state and metropolitan agencies. And then if enacted into law, they would go uh, into effect January 1st, 2021. So there's a couple of things at play with the recommendations. The recommendations are based on a maximum range um, that's a percentage of the governor's salary. And then the recommendations also include which group an individual agency head or metropolitan um, head fits into. The statute provides for three groups. Uh, I think uh, Greg mentioned that there's group one is the big agencies. A lot of the agency heads are gonna fall into that group. And that group is um, the maximum is set as a, at 133% of the uh, governor's salary. I will note though that that is also uh, adjusted for inflation each year. And so the the amount that is uh, in, uh, in effect right now is the maximum is higher than that. So that's for 2021 is uh, one uh, 185,759. So, um, so the ranges that this council would recommend to the legislature, if those are adopted by the legislature and go into effect, then the actual appointing authorities need to set the salaries themselves. And so for most of those people, that's going to be the governor the, who hires and fires uh, the agency heads. Um, the governor then makes a recommendation within the range of what the salary is actually going to be. And then that salary also has to be adopted by the legislature. So first it goes to the LCC uh, and there is a subcommittee on employee relations set up for this purpose to either approve or not approve that salary. And then ultimately that goes, uh, like I said, to the legislature. And just like with the uh, the constitutional officers and judges, uh, it, it's up to the legislature whether or not uh, those are actually adopted. And then uh, I think Greg is going to go over in a little bit more detail uh, what this has looked like over the years. Greg? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to share a document again. Um, so this is a um, a spreadsheet that shows recent history of salaries for heads of state agencies. Um, I would uh, point you first to about halfway down the page where we show the salary ranges that um, Marta was just talking about. That is the specific responsibility of this council is to uh, recommend the maximum for those three ranges. As Marta has mentioned, those ranges are set as a percentage of the governor's salary, but then in, in addition, they are indexed by inflation. So for most agencies, the current limit is 185,000, roughly $800. Um, the mid-sized group is $167,000. And the small group for the Metro agencies is not indexed and has remained at 31,900. Um, if you look at the list of agencies, they're uh, grouped together for um, groups one, two, and three. Um, and then they were in alphabetical order. So the commissioner of administration salary is 144,900. Um, that is substantially below the limit that is currently in effect of $185,000. So the governor could propose up to a $40,000 increase for this commissioner and be within the limit that is currently in law. Um, as you can see, salaries for uh, commissioners have not changed since July of 2015. Um, neither uh, Governor Dayton nor Governor Walls has proposed increases since that time. So uh, the legislature, as Marta mentioned, has to approve these increases, but there haven't been any proposals made to increase those salaries. Mr. Chair, that's um, the information that we have on agency heads. And Mr. Chair, this is Michelle Weber again. Um, Stephanie James did have one additional document to review with the council um, due to the questions that were being asked. We 
stepped forward to the 2019 recommendations, but she has an overview of information related to constitutional officers, if you'd like her to speak. Sure. Mr. Terry, members, I just wanted to point out um, just call the, call the agent that, and say it's all which we're offering. That the committee's task is to consider um, all the com components of um, compensation for the constitutional officers and the judges. And so you have a memo that lays out the retirement benefits um, for, for those folks um, and what their contributions to their plans are. So for the constitutional officers, they have a defined contribution plan. Uh, the state as the employer contributes 6.25% of their salary to the plan and the employee contributes 6% of their salary to the plan. Um, those are required contributions. Um, and then the, the benefit on retirement is, uh, a, you know, like any defined contribution plan, the, the contributions plus net earnings, net investment earnings. The judges have a defined benefit plan. Um, the judges fall into two tiers uh, based partly on the date of their hire and partly on a choice that they're offered. Um, judges in the tier one group, um, for, for judges in the tier one group, the employer contribution is 22.5% of their salary and the employee contribution is 9%. And then the benefit for those folks when they, on retirement is um, an amount that is calculated from their high five salary times a multiplier. Uh, multiplier is different on different time frames, and then that amount is capped at 76.8% of their high five salary. For the tier two judges, the employee's per, um, contribution is 7% of salary, and then um, there is no cap on the benefit. And then there's also a calculation from on their high five salary, um, different multipliers for different periods, um, and, and, and those are slightly different from tier one to tier two. And that was, that was all I had on that. I just wanted to point out that you're considering full compensation, um, including retirement and insurance benefits. So what is the answer to the question, Stephanie? When there is a range for a commissioner's compensation, who determines what that salary is going to be? Mr. Chair and members, I'll defer to Ms. James, the other Ms. James on this. Um, she, she's handling the agency head salary parts of today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So again, this council would set the salary range, but the appointing authority would actually set the salary itself. Uh, and for most of these agency heads, that's gonna be the governor. But then that process is also subject to ratification by the legislature, um, first uh, going to the subcommittee on employee relations and then ultimately to the legislature. So the Thank governor is going to set the salary based on the range. You must wear your mask. Thank you. And unless you are actively. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Fox has a question. Thank you. Mr. Fox. Jim. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so I forget who was presenting this on the judges, but um, can you, I've got two questions. How many judges are included in this, uh, these retirement plans, tier one and tier two? And then the second question is, how many of those judges are currently in tier one? I'm assuming that that's the older version of the retirement plan. Um. Mr. Chair and members, I have I have part of that answer. I don't I don't think I quite have all of it. There's currently working 173 judges who are in tier one and 149 in tier two. And then I also know that there are 298 retired judges. That's a combination of tier one and tier two. And I don't have a breakout of that, but we can get that for you. No, the 298 is not the issue. It's the how many are currently in tier one and tier two. So thank you. Are there other questions? Well, shall we go on to Roman numeral seven, the presentation of requests? Mr. Chair, this is Greg Hubinger. 
Uh, yes. Legislative, legislative staff had one more uh, document that we thought might be helpful to you in response to a question that was raised um, a moment ago about how our how our folks stack up against uh, those in other states. Uh, this is a survey from the Council of State Governments, um, and there's one page for each of the constitutional officers um, on this. And this is sorted by um, the salary of the governor. Uh, first, the highest paid salary is to California with a salary of about 201,000. Minnesota, Minnesota shows up in 38th place in this survey. The Next um, page is for the um, lieutenant governor. Um, in this ranking, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota's lieutenant governor at $82,000 is 30th out of 50. Um, this page shows the rankings for attorney generals. Um, for attorney generals across the country, uh, Minnesota's attorney generals paid $121,000. And that is the yeah, ranks at 32nd. And then um, this page shows the ranking for secretaries of state. And again, Minnesota is in the midfield at uh, 31st place with a salary of 95,000. And then finally, for the um, uh, state auditor, uh, Minnesota State Auditor is paid $108,000, and that is about 29th place. So we're at about the, a little bit below the midpoint for most of our constitutional officers. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions, let's talk about the scheduling that's identified here. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, this is Michelle Weber again from the Legislative Coordinating Commission. And um, today you will receive uh, testimony from uh, the judicial branch on the requests that they've made to the legislature related to salaries. At the next meeting on February 19th, Minnesota Management and Budget will be available to speak to any um, recommendations that they might have. And each of the constitutional officers have also been invited to testify before you. I'm going to leave the phone for just a moment. Okay. And Ms. I Olson, carry on. Will do. Go ahead, Michelle. So uh, Vice Chair Olson, I believe now the next presentation would be from Jeff Shorba from the Judicial Branch. Great, is Mr. Shorba available? I am here, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, great. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you again. Nice to see you. So uh, good afternoon. Um, as I said, my name is Jeff Shorba. I'm the State Court Administrator uh, for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. And I was asked to appear before you today to provide information on the judicial branch FY fiscal year 22-23 biennial budget request um, as it relates to judicial compensation increases. So before I do that, I just wanna take a quick minute to explain how we come up with our biennial budget request. Uh, we have a judicial council, uh, which is our administrative policy making body for the branch and it's responsible for developing the biennial budget request. It's chaired by the chief justice it's comprised of 25 members, 19 judges, and six administrators. And they have put together this request. They considered many important, worthy proposals brought forward by our judges and staff across the state. And ultimately, the funding request Judicial Council approved includes really only the highest priority budget issues facing our courts um, as determined through lots and lots of discussion. So I think you have a handout which goes over the request, but just from a high level, uh, we're asking the legislature for uh, $17.7 million over our base budget, which is about a 2.4% increase over our base. Um, and the request really tries to do three things. One is recognize um, that this is a very tough economic time right now. Um, and also recognize, however, that our judges and staff, especially during this pan pandemic, are doing some really important 
um, and hard and difficult work. So in the first year of the biennium, fiscal year 22, we're basically asking the governor and the legislature to hold the branch harmless while the state sort of wrestles uh, to try to get out of this pandemic. So the only new funding we're asking for in the first year of the next biennium is the employer share of un unavoidable healthcare increases. So the judicial branch goes along with the executive branch. The executive branch negotiates what it's gonna cost for health insurance for our employees and judges. Um, and the employer share is estimated to go up by Minnesota management and budget. So in the first year, we're only asking for that increase that we'll have to pay, no other new money. In the second year of the biennium, uh, we're seeking funding for compensation for our judges and staff at the rate of 3% increase, um, in addition to that health insurance increase that I just talked about. I think it's a hopeful budget that uh, maybe in the second year of the biennium, things will be a little better but a realistic budget in the first year that we have some tough times and we uh, want to help the governor and the legislature figure out um, how to balance the budget. This request doesn't ask for everything we'd love to get money for in the courts. Um, and we had had a lot of internal debate about what to ask for and came up with what we consider sort of a modest increase of 2.4% over our base. Um, so we recognize the legislature has a very difficult job. We were very pleased to see that the governor has included our request um, in his budget submission to the legislature. So um, we'll continue to talk with our funding committees in the House and Senate um, about the request. So I just wanna conclude by thanking all of you uh, for inviting me here today and also thanking you for your service. Um, you have to make some very important recommendations. Um, and I appreciate having sat in on the beginning part of your meeting about how difficult sometimes that is to make very good recommendations and then possibly not see them come to fruition. So uh, we in the judiciary appreciate all of your work. Thank you. And I'm certainly available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Oh, there we go. Sam's back. Okay. Jeff. Uh... On February 19th, we're going to hear some testimony from a representative of the Minnesota District Judges Association. Will they be saying much the same thing as you've been saying? Yes, they are supportive of this request for the next biennium to wait on salary increases for the second year. I'm sure they'll give you lots of other information about what they're gathering from around the country. And I, I know they have an economist who's done some work for them. But I think in this biennium, we're all uh, unified behind this request. Thank you. Uh, Gail, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, the other... I was just going to ask if people had questions of Mr. Shorba. So, and you had a great one. I've got a question for Jeff, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jeff, I was just uh, wondering, this is Charlie Weaver. Um, so we're gonna get some, I was gonna ask you about comparative data like we had with the constitutional officers. Will we, will we get that at the next meeting then? Um, yeah, I thought we had submitted some um, comparative data that the National Center for State Courts put together. Um, as to where our judges rank right now. Um, I can give you that briefly um, in summary form. Right now, our uh, Supreme Court justices rank uh, 24th in the country. Um, our Court of Appeals judges, 22nd. And our trial court judges, 25th um, in the country. So if you haven't already gotten this survey, um, I will make sure that either myself or Janet Marshall, get it to Greg so that you can take a look at it um, in detail. I assume that includes benefits as well as compensation? It's just compensation. Just compensation. Yeah, just compensation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
when I notice that the next item on the agenda is council discussion. Shall we talk? <clears throat> is everyone tired? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Sean Dallas. I do have one question. Uh, in our instructions by statute, it says the amount of compensation paid in government service and the private sector to persons with similar call qualifications uh, are need to be considered. Are we going to uh, have some kind of comparison between public and private uh, qualifications for the governor, stuff like that, that if there are equivalencies in the private sector relative to the governor and those wages? It's pretty difficult to equate a governorship with the chief executive officer of a privately held or publicly held company. But if the information is available, we should have it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think in the past we have spoken anecdotally about the salaries, for example, of large nonprofits. Uh, there's little benefit in comparing to large corporations um, because of the great yeah. differential. But but we have looked anecdotally at, at some of those kinds of salaries, but we don't have one document to produce for that. It is interesting, Gail, just in the time span of this various pile of material from two, 2003 on, the private sector has increased dramatically, but so has the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. It no longer is the orphan in the group. Mr. Chair, this is Jim Fox. Yes, sir. Um, I think we discussed this a couple of years ago, but just from my experience in looking at not-for-profits, uh, private sector, publicly traded organizations, if the, the comparison categories that you're going to look at, I mean, normally you'd say, well, what's the, what's the revenue or what's the budget of the state in comparison to a private sector organization? And it's and where you may get comparable budgets and comparable size of employees, the, the compensation in both not-for-profits of similar size and, pub and publicly traded organizations is going to be so outlandishly different than what the governor is paid or any governor in any state is paid that it, uh, while it may be informative, it isn't very instructive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's artfully put. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kathy, maybe you have some comments on that, having been at the University of Minnesota. Yes, um, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Um, the uh, question that I had is a lot of times at the university, we would think about where we ranked in the Big Ten. And not wanting to be at the bottom, not necessarily thinking we had the resources to be at the top. And I don't know if this committee has ever said, you know, but in the 50 states, we think we should be at about 25. And what I heard was that the judicial system is close to 25, somewhere between 20 and 25. And our other officers are well below that, somewhere. You know, substantially below that by five. Do whatever you got to do, Scott. Yeah, and so I just wondered if that's been considered by this group in the past or not. Mr. Chair, this is Jim Fox. Um, we, we did some comparisons last time with um, some um, population figures, some uh, number of employees within the state governments and I think there was some um, uh, sal average salaries, uh, you know, median salaries of the population and tried to use those comparisons to say, where should the state of Minnesota be if those were criteria that mattered? And that's where we came in at the, you know, about the 20th mark 
uh, as a recommendation or somewhere in that. So um, the fact that we have fallen to the 30th um, is not encouraging, <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, they're, they're very difficult uh, things to get a handle on in terms of what's, what's comparable, what's, what's comparable. I mean, some people said, well, we ought to look at Wisconsin. Well, actually Wisconsin wasn't a very good comparison on those characteristics. Um, some other states, which you wouldn't consider uh, to be very comparable, were on those characteristics. So, you know, we, we, could, uh, we could look at five or six different comparable numbers, um, you know, using some of those as starting points to say, all right, where, sh where should that put us? And, um, you know, it, it, that might be informative. I, I think we'll, um, my gut tells me we're going to end up about where the 2019 recommendations were. And Mr. Know. Chair, Mr. Meyerson has his hand up as well. Mr. Meyerson, by all means. Uh, yes, no. Th this may be coming from sheer ignorance, but I'm wondering if uh, different courts are different judges of different workloads and if that could come into play when we consider judicial salaries. Well, I think <clears throat> I've always managed to avoid all litigation, so I'm not an expert on that. But I suspect that in the rural areas, the workload is somewhat less. But I don't know that for a fact. Is Mr. Sharva still available? Mr. Chair? Yes. Do we know if Mr. Shorba is still available and whether he could answer that? I heard your question, but oh, I was I'm waiting sorry. to hear from Mr. 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 Chair and Vice Chair Olson. It looks like he has left the meeting. Okay. <sighs> Although I will say that it's probably a, a better question asked of the representative of the District Judges Association. I think that's right. We we did discuss that in prior councils, uh, and I don't think it correlates necessarily to rural versus urban. And part of that is just the ability to shift workload within different regions. So I, I think it would be helpful to be able to yeah. ask them that. Mr. Chair, uh, this yes. is... Uh, I believe we could ask the court for their workload studies. They, um, my recollection is that they do a fair amount of um, monitoring and use those data to assign judges in the various districts. Or well, I think we should indeed ask for it. What you can tell is running through my head is the notion of getting all this done by April 1st and still having an impact on the legislature is daunting. And that April 1st is a strange date. I also think that it's, it, it's, a, it's worthwhile to explore whether there's an uneven caseload um, whether this body would want to make a recommendation to the Supreme Court about how it should determine uh, how to pay every judge, I think is another question. They clearly have done it by categories. Excuse me. Um, so that might be, I'm thinking that might be biting off more than we can chew. Given the time we have, you're probably right, Gail. Uh, Mr. Deere, can I just make one other point? I, I want to point this out because I think it was salient uh, the last time around. Uh, the, re the proposal we made to the le legislature last time was uh, for increases that would still be lower than a straight inflationary increase would have provided those offices, except in the auditor and secretary of state categories, which are very low. Um, so just to note that we're, we have lagged way behind 
uh, inflation aside from other salaries in other states and so forth, other comparators? Do our folks want to tell us about the schedule for February 19th? Mr. Chair, yes. As I mentioned, um, Minnesota Management Budget will be available to present an overview. At that point in time, they won't yet have the February forecast data, but they'll have the November forecast. They will also present information on recent um, labor contract settlements as well as any recommendations they may have associated with the agency head salaries. Each of the constitutional officers have also been invited to share an overview with the uh, council about the responsibilities of the constitutional officers. And we do have the Minnesota District Judges Association also um, has requested to testify in front of the council. And I've Thank been you. taking notes about the data items that you've asked about. So we'll work to see if we can um, get some of that additional information. Janet Marshall um, just joined us from the courts. And uh, I, so Ch Mr. Chair, I wanted to mention that as well uh, because Mr. Sharba had to step off. So I think Janet might be able to answer some questions that you had. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Now I'm getting feedback for, oh, okay. Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, so the question was whether judges in the metro area had a bigger or harder workload than judges in greater Minnesota, I think. Sort of, yes. Okay, and I would say, yes, we can provide you with our weighted caseload study, which measures the workload of judges throughout the state. But we have always said that a judge is a judge no matter where you are. And judges in greater Minnesota, to some extent, have to know many more areas of the law than judges in, say, Hennepin or Ramsey, which are assigned to a specific case type. So we've always said they all work just as hard and they all have to be just as smart as each other. And you don't take account of differences in the cost of living. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a reminder that base masks are to be worn and we never at all times. The only time we're asking that you not wear your face mask is when you are actually eating or <laughs> drinking. Thank you. I thank all of you for allowing me to do this in this very clumsy fashion from a world club where I'm told every 10 minutes to put on my fa face mask. Uh, but I just wanted to add, we, we're happy to provide our most recent weighted caseload study to Michelle. And I did just send Michelle the National Center for State Courts, which is comparable to the National Legislators Organization, their latest report on the comparison of judges' salaries with other states. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there other comments? Gail Olson, thank you for your graciousness. Have we reached the end of the agenda? Looks like it. So Mr. Chair, I believe now a motion to adjourn the meeting and the next council meeting will happen on Friday, February 19th. Also is, there, we'll... is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a very good weekend all and thank you to the staff and people who know a lot more than we do. We appreciate it very much. Bye-bye.